Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at a book that's always been near and dear to me, Wilderness Survival Guide by Kim Nolan, published by TSR in 1986. This book brought a lot to the table, literally. It's got a lot of uh, rules for wilderness encounters, and this was in an era where dungeons were just starting to not be all that were published, and you were starting to see more and more outdoor type adventures, uh, what's now a sandbox. This book helped us put some sand in the sandbox. You had an opportunity to really explore the outside world and the effects of the outside world, the weather, and just a ton of things. So I'm going to go over this book, uh, how I used it in play, how I use it in play, and uh, even some use I found for it with the battle system set. So today on page 121, Wilderness Survival Guide by Kim Mon. Wilderness Survival Guide by Kim Mon. This book came out hard on the heels of the Dungeoneer Survival Guide, and it's really cut from the same cloth. The idea is that you would have a book here that would help you understand how to put your player characters through the Underdark environment in Dungeoneer Survival Guide. This one gives you the Wilderness Survival Guide. The Underdark Survival Guide was more about uh, flavor and feeling. This one's a lot more rules intensive, and actually I think that's a good thing. One thing D&D really needed was some comprehensive wilderness rules. So, first off, there's my stamp. This was at a time just after I left that uh, club, or the club had broken up, where we used to have to stamp our books. I was in the habit, so I stamped it. So this is my original copy I bought in 1986. We have the preface there. We have a nice little preface by Kim Mullen. Kim was a uh, regular contributor to D&D, and I believe he even did a stint as uh, Dragon Editor for a while, Dragon Magazine Editor. So we got the table of contents here, and then a quick look at what it is. Now, I want to draw attention here, tables. Look at all the tables that were in this book. There's a lot of information in here to just spice, spice up your wilderness uh, games. And let's face it, most of us do games where at least part of the adventure is outside. Uh, I know I do. I do outside games all the time, and I found this book pretty valuable for that. I'm going to pull my lighting a little closer so we get a better look, better look at the page. There we go. How's that? Yep. Okay. So we've got the types of terrain, the overview of the wilderness. So we've got desert, forest, what all these terms mean. Hills, mountains, plains, seacoast, swamp. And uh, just what each one means so you have a nice baseline reference. I'm trying to get everything in the shot. There we go. And then wilderness proficiencies. This was kind of the main meat of this book. I'm not going to go into it a ton in this video because I'm going to do a video just on proficiencies that will be coming up very soon. Uh, and how I added proficiencies to some of the races and character classes in AD&D. So there's a list of the proficiencies and what each proficiency does and how they benefit you. These are non-weapon proficiencies. Uh, this is dressing for the weather, uh, you know, your personal temperature, that's how warm you are in your, your clothing, as opposed to what the temperature is outside. And then the effects, effects of the environment. Here is where we start getting into hypothermia, uh, just wind chill, a lot of other things that you don't think about in D&D, but would actually impact the players tremendously. So wind, special weather, which is hurricanes. Uh, I've done a couple of seagoing adventures where I've had a hurricane. This book came in uh, very handy for that, uh, especially cold damage. If you're doing any kind of uh, snow adventure, this is a very important aspect. Uh, what kind of uh, damage you take from the cold and how you move in the snow. In our game, by the way, if you have a ring of water walking, you can walk on top of snow, leaving only very slight depressions in the snow. Because we ruled that snow is just frozen water. So I'm sure we're not the only ones that use the ring of water walking that way, but it was kind of neat. So, frostbite and how to take damage from it. Blowing sand or dust. Encumbrance and movement. This book really comes into its own here. Uh, encumbrance, let's face it, a lot of us hand wave encumbrance. I, knew, I know I do. I've never been one to uh, bog down 
in the details of encumbrance. But that being said, encumbrance can be very important to the game. This, uh, I was more about encumbrance on beasts of burden, animals, or on wagons than anything else. So this helped me a bunch in that regard. Uh, movement, land-based, and then climbing, climbing with encumbrance, chance of falling. And this book even takes nice look into what a thief would gain, uh, what benefits they would gain from climbing slopes and things like that. It does nice modifiers. Here we go. Non-thief, and then we have modifiers for thieves. Damage from falling. This kind of settled the whole D&D &D damage question. Was it 1 die 6 per 10 feet, or 1 die 6, then 2 die 6, etc.? So this chart ended that. We have it cleanly here. How you stop a fall, roping together, belaying, rappelling. All, pretty much whatever you would need. How to jump. The famous moment, Lord of the Rings. When uh, Gimli's got to make the jump. And when they're in Moria. Well, there it is. Now you have the rules for a jump. I'm trying to get rid of this shadow. I don't know what's going on with my lights today. Okay. Swimming. Treading water, holding one's breath. These were rules that really hadn't been dealt with in tremendous detail. We had some dragon articles on them, but that was about it. This book gave us our final word on it. And this was late in AD&D's time in 86. AD&D would only be around till really till about 89. So it was kind of nice to get this. This was a little after D&D had peaked, but was still a, this book was of great interest to all of us. Boating. Flying mounts. I wore these pages out. My player characters had had a mount here and there of Pegasus usually, and I didn't have a ton of rules on it other than the DMG with the flight levels, you know, A, B, C, D for maneuverability. I was never a fan of that system. This gave us a lot more to do. It still carries over the maneuverability class, but it cleaned it up a little bit. And then I love this picture. Love the artwork in this book, by the way. Uh, very mid-80s. D, D artwork. I mean, these, these pictures are just so cool. Food and water. This goes into hunting and foraging. How would you gather food? How would you live off the land? Again, things that, oddly enough, were pretty sparse in D&D. &D. Uh, hunting proficiency, fishing. A lot of these sections really expand on the what the proficiencies do. So, very useful again. Camping and campfires. Let's face it. Most of us hand wave the camping and campfires, but this you get into the nuts and bolts. So if you really want to dial in, this is definitely your book for it. If you're carrying any kind of tent or portable shelter, we all love Lehman's Tiny Hut. Uh, good sleep versus bad sleep where you don't get any real sleep. Forest fires, I did a great game years ago where the player characters came out of the dungeon, which had collapsed behind them so they couldn't go back in, to find themselves on the edge of a forest fire that was spreading. So the player characters had to get out. That was partly inspired by this section of this book. And then the climbing section, uh, which I just went through a little bit, uh, also inspired a game where I had the players come out of the dungeon, and as they were making their way up and out, of the, it was in a valley, uh, they saw signs of an army approaching. They took cover and, and spied a little bit and found out it was an orc army with scouts spread out wide, so they didn't feel they could evade it so they decided well we'll go the other way well what they were marching into was another orc army coming from the other direction with the player characters in the middle they were in a valley their only way out was up nobody had flight or levitation so it became quite a challenge for the players to get up and out of the valley before the two armies met and ground them between them i also carried that over to a battle system game where i let the player characters have one orc army and then the other orc army and they played against each other to win. And it was kind of neat because nobody really had any stake in it. It was just battle system for fun. So now we go medicine and first aid. Very important to player characters. Treatments of injuries. Uh, it just This book gives just a ton. And there are a lot of rules in here. Vision and visibility. This did a lot in our campaign to really dial in uh, the vision and infravision, ultravision, what it was, what it could do. We'd read a lot of this prior to this, but it was still really nice to have. Just a scotch. There we go. That's a little bit better look. Okay. And then volcanoes, natural hazards in the wilderness. 
So we've got volcanoes, uh, ash eruptions, lava itself. We've all played D&D games where the player characters had to deal with a lava situation. Earthquakes. Uh, yes, earthquakes happen. I've used them as uh, adventure hooks. Why is the ground shaking? That sort of thing. Really good artwork. I love this artwork. And quicksand. Never really done much with quicksand, but if you're an old fan of the old Tarzan movies, which I am, thank you, Ron Ely. Uh, he was in the Tarzan series. Uh, quicksand is near and dear to your heart. May as well catch somebody in. Combat rules for wilderness play. Gives you fighting while climbing or while you're precariously balanced. Fighting in water. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, and then missile combat from a mount, forcing opponents to dismount. All kinds of rules here. Fatigue and exhaustion. Never one I dialed in on a bunch. I would be more worried about how tired your animals were than the player characters. Uh, how far you could fly your flying mount in a day. What kind of weather conditions it could fly in. And then we go more into mounts and beasts of burden. Uh, this is interesting because it actually gives druids a place to shine. With uh, mounts where they can speak with animals or they know how to tend the animals. And this is where some of the non-weapon proficiencies come in as well. Nice little picture of a donkey being stubborn. And then magic in the wilderness. This is how your various spells and magic items would react to various things in the wilderness. There's some pretty nice stuff in here. Uh, you know, armor gives you additional protection against uh, heat or cold, which is interesting. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I don't remember ever using it, but it's still a cool idea. Detect snares and pits, feign death, some spells that might otherwise go unused. There's about six pages of, of spells in here. And then you get down to rings, scrolls, you know, ring of heat resist or ring of fire resistance, obviously, for uh, obvious reasons, very useful. Free action is a uh, very popular one in our group. Uh, keeps you from getting entangled in vines and undergrowth. And then you get down to your miscellaneous magic. And then you have a DM section they call starting from scratch. And this is basically... I don't know why DMs only would be able to read this, but it's kind of coaching you on how to use this book and how to add weather as an element of your game. You don't want to get too buried in this game, just like in Dungeoneer Survival Guide. Uh, I found myself getting kind of buried in this game, or in this book rather, where I was getting really dialed into the details. My player, players were just kind of sitting there tapping their pencils without a ton to do while I figured out exactly what temperature it was outside. So I learned how to kind of dial that back a little bit and make it more of a passive thing than an active time slower in my game. So we got day-to-day -day changes for the weather. Uh, this can be very important if you've got anybody with any kind of weather control, which is not uncommon in D&D. Uh, any kind of extraordinary precipitation. I did a game years ago where the party was in a dungeon and they... Uh, came out into a blizzard. They ended up having to hide out in the dungeon. There were still some active monsters in there and things like that. And then once the blizzard was done, they had to dig out and then traverse the area. That's pretty interesting. Weather can be a good opponent. It's one of the, you know, oppositions in writing is, you know, weather is one of them. Man versus environment. Uh, relative humidity. This can be interesting if you're going to do Isle of the Ape. Study this section because it'll give you a lot of insight into what exactly you're going to do to mess with the players on Isle of the Ape. If you saw my video on that one, you know that the environment in that one is as much an opponent as anything else. And then tides, which can be important to an uh, ongoing game. And here are the compiled tables. This is really nice. I liked having the ta tables compiled back here. It gave me one place to go to draw my information. It's This was a well-put-together book. Here's some Hex paper for you. You could copy this and draw your wilderness maps on it, three different sizes. Then, of course, the index of where you could find stuff, and then the end of the book. 128 pages. It was $15. It uh, was repackaged a few years later. Uh, they apparently had a lot of unsold copies of this one, which I find a little surprising, but as I said, D&D was kind of in the downswing. Uh, so they repackaged it with some of the unsold copies, and... Uh, Gave out a little adventure that came with it. I never bought that one because, obviously, I had the book already for a few years. I didn't want to spend the money again. 
Uh, this is available on DriveThruRPG as a PDF. I want to say it's $10. Uh, the original book price was $15. Uh, it, this is just a really nice addition to your campaign. It's going to breathe a lot of life into your campaign. So between the Wilderness Survival Guide and the predecessor to the Dungeoneer Survival Guide, you pretty much have everything you need for the uh, environments that your characters are going to be playing in. So that's it for today from page 121. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe. If you have any comments or, criti or not criticisms, kind criticisms are most, most welcome. Uh, but constructive criticisms or uh, any ideas for future videos, please let me know. And I'll see you next time on page 121.